Uh, but at, at this point, at this time, uh, I would uh, like to, um, well, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our lunchtime speaker. Um, oh, sorry, I saw a hand up. Okay, you, you're okay, okay. Um, so I, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Hawaii State Supreme Court Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald. And uh, I have a prepared speech, so I'm gonna um, read some of it. Um, uh, Marky e. Rechtenwald was sworn in as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court on September 14th, 2010. And he joined the Supreme Court as an Associate Justice on May 11th, 2009, and previously served as Chief Judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals beginning in April 2007. And I'm just going to pause and interject with my own um, personal experience with working with um, CJ, uh, I was a law clerk at the Intermediate Court of Appeals when he was the CJ there, and uh, I just want to tell you, I that was just such a great work experience, and um, he really engendered such a collegial atmosphere there at the ICA. And you know, we always had lots of um, parties and potlucks and things like that. And um, CJ was right in there, washing the dishes and setting the tables, and you know, he was always involved and interested in um, all the staffs. Um, Hap life happenings and whatnot, and you know he's even known to come and visit the law clerks at the hospital when they had their first babies. <laughs> Thank you, CJ. <laughs> um, so um, he really is awesome. And then whenever I see him on the street or he's talking to the hot dog guy outside the Supreme Court, you know, when I see him, he's asking me about language access. So I know um, on a personal level that this is an important issue that he's always thinking about. Um, so I'll move on to the rest of you know, his accolades here. Um, prior to his appointment to the ICA, Rechtenwald served as the director of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs and as assistant US Attorney General for the District of Hawaii and as an attorney in private practice. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and a law degree from the University of Chicago. Very cold places, we're happy he's here and warm. <laughs> and under CJ's leadership, the judiciary has earned national accolades. It is remarkable to observe his ability to bring people together around ideas and goals and to draw out the best in everyone. It's very true. Um, I'll mention just one recent example of his leadership and one that's very relevant here. Hawaii as a state, which includes the judiciary and all the partners that the Chief Justice has helped bring together, was ranked third in the country uh, for practices aimed at making access to justice a reality for all, third in the country. Um, and within the same, yes. <laughs> and within the same ranking, despite minimal resources, Hawaii was ranked number one. Number one for providing support for people with limited English proficiency. So. <laughs> Big round of applause for that. So with that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Hawaii, Mark Rechtenwald. Thank you. Good afternoon, aloha everyone. And it's good, it's good to see Becky, you know, um, the Intermediate Court of Appeals really is a special place, and it's a special place for a lot of reasons, but probably the primary reason is because of the role that Chief Judge Jim Burns had at that court, founding it and creating the culture of the court and guiding it for, I guess it was 25 years or so, and his values are values of taking care of each other, of being inclusive, of fundamental fairness, and hard work, and those are all the values that you see in that court, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to come into that court and then have his guidance and uh, mentorship when I became chief judge back in 2007. So, you know, sometimes places become special places because of special people who bring qualities to their jobs and something extra to their work, and Jim Burns is certainly one of those folks. So thank you very much, Becky, and it brings back a lot of good memories to talk about the ICA. Um, 
I want to thank the Office of Language Access for sponsoring this conference uh, and for inviting me to speak today. It's been 10 years since our state's language access law was enacted, so this is a fitting time to review the progress that's been made and to chart a path for addressing the many challenges that remain. Uh, I recall seeing that new law for the first time when I was the director of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs and thinking that we had a lot of work to do to get where we needed to be when I first saw that law. And when I look today at all that the uh, Office of Language Affairs and the Language Access Advisory Council have done and the strong community of supporters and advocates that supports and furthers the office's mission, there's a lot of reason to take pride and to be optimistic about the future. I'd like to speak to you today uh, from my perspective as Chief Justice. The judiciary is a large organization with about 82 full-time judges and more than 1,800 employees statewide. In the last fiscal year, we had more than 100,000 cases filed in our courts across the state, excluding traffic cases, so more than 100,000 cases. However, we do a lot more than just adjudicating or deciding cases. We provide a wide range of services that address the underlying causes and effects of what brought those parties in front of the court in the first place. And those services range from juvenile and adult probation supervision to programs like our drug court, mental health court, and veterans treatment court, to Kids First, which provides support to kids whose parents are going through a divorce, to our children's justice centers where child victims and witnesses to crimes are interviewed. Now, according to U.S. Census data, and I know you all know this, one in four Hawaii residents speak a language other than English at home, and one in eight is considered limited English proficient. So we know that the judiciary is going to interact with many people each year who will need language access services. And indeed, in the fiscal year 2015, we provided free court interpreters to LEP persons in over 10,000 court proceedings at a cost of over $650,000. The courts exist to provide equal justice to all, but that promise of equal justice rings hollow if people can't meaningfully participate in the judicial process because they don't understand what is being said or can't express their own thoughts. As the American Bar Association has recognized, access to justice is unattainable for those who are not proficient in English unless they have access to language services. To achieve justice, we must ensure that all people have meaningful access to the judiciary. And this is why the judiciary provides free of charge interpreters for everyone with a substantial interest in every type of court case and to people who access the many other services that the judiciary provides. We're grateful for the hundreds of, inter of, of dedicated interpreters who help in that effort, many of whom are here today, and I'd like to thank them and acknowledge them. And can you please join me in doing so? <clears throat> our language services program is an integral part of our broader effort to provide, to reduce barriers to access to justice. One of those barriers is the inability of thousands of people who come before our courts each year to afford an attorney to represent themselves in civil cases and who must accordingly represent themselves in a process, the civil justice process, that can be confusing and unfamiliar to a non-lawyer. Now to address that need, we've worked with our Access to Justice Commission, the Hawaii State Bar Association, and the Legal Aid Society to provide self-help resources to people who can't afford an attorney to represent them in their civil cases. And recently I heard of an example of how the judiciary services in this area came together to assist an LEP individual. An elderly woman who spoke only Korean went to the court's self-help center in Honolulu where volunteer attorneys assist people who are representing themselves in court. The volunteer attorney discovered that this woman had been served with papers that instructed her to appear for a court proceeding. However, because she couldn't understand those papers, she had missed the court date. As a result, a collection agency had obtained a default judgment and was now bringing a collection action against her. Using an interpreter, the volunteer attorney was able to figure out what had happened and explain her options, including a possible settlement. And when the woman returned to follow up, an interpreter was again used to communicate with her and ensure that her issues had been satisfactorily resolved. 
This example shows how many resources, interpreters, volunteer attorneys, and Amer AmeriCorps staffers at the self-help centers came together to help an LEP individual achieve a fair and just outcome. Our state judiciary has been recently recognized nationally for its language access programs, as you heard a moment ago. This year, the Justice Index ranked Hawaii's judiciary third among all states for access to justice and first in the nation for its support for people with limited English proficiency. And our multilingual website was also recognized this year by the National Association of Court Managers for its improved communication and access to justice using web technology. I'm very proud of these awards, which highlight the judiciary's commitment to language access, and I'm grateful for all the hard work that they represent. In particular, the judiciary's Office on Equality and Access to the Courts, led by Debbie Tulang Da Silva, has been the heart and soul of our efforts. Debbie is going to be honored next month by the Hawaii State Bar Association for her great leadership, and that recognition is very well deserved. I thank Debbie, Melody Kubo, who's here today, and the other members of their great team for their many accomplishments, including developing our court interpreter certification program, under which interpreters receive training on the court system, ethics, and modes of interpreting needed in court. I'd also like to extend my thanks to the many other people in the judiciary and the community who've worked so hard to expand our language assistance services, including my colleague Justice Sabrina McKenna, who's absolutely an amazing leader and has worked so hard in this area for so many years. I'm so grateful for what you've done, Justice McKenna. Thank you very much. Judge Gerald Kibe, Judge Linda Luke, the Committee on Equality and Access to the Courts, the Committee on Court Interpreters and Language Access, the Joint Title VI Subcommittee, and the Judiciary's Administrative Staff. However, we have much work to do, and the road we are on has had its challenges. In September of 2013, we learned that the U.S. Department of Justice would be reviewing our state judiciary's language access programs. Although the DOJ review required the judiciary to de dedicate significant time and resources to, request, to responding to requests for information, we decided to embrace the process as an opportunity to improve. The GO DOJ closed its review after just 18 months and a positive lasting partnership was formed. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Vanita Gupta commended the judiciary's proactive language access efforts and its collaborative and cooperative approach. We took many positive steps, including revising our language access policy, implementing an awareness campaign to increase the public's knowledge about how to access language services, and making it easier for court users to raise concerns about our services, among other initiatives. Collaboration plays a large role in the judiciary's language access efforts. For example, when the DOJ review began, we reached out to others in the community who were, uh, to learn more about their programs. As a result, we saw the multilingual emergency information cards developed by state civil defense, and were given permission to use those cards as the basis of our own language ID cards. The judiciary's language ID cards are now available in 14 non-English languages frequently encountered in our courts and services. The cards are small, yet they make a huge difference to court and service users. The card identifies the language the individual speaks and states, please find someone who can speak my language so we can talk to each other. The cards are in English on one side and the non-English language on the other. And through federal grant funding, our language ID cards have been printed and are now available at every courthouse in the state. LEP court users can simply show the language ID card to judiciary staff who've been trained on how to provide appropriate language services. We also partnered with the Hawaii Access to Justice Commission, which has been a leader in our access to justice efforts, to develop a brochure on how to request an interpreter and translated it into six non-English languages frequently encountered in the Hawaii State Courts. This important po information is posted on the judiciary's website. And that access to justice grant also enable us to trade attorneys in Kona on how to effectively work with an interpreter. In addition to being the beneficiary of others' expertise and assistance, we've also sought to share both our experiences and our resources with others. Language ID cards are now being adopted by the city and county of Honolulu, and our how to use a court interpreter brochure is being adapted by the Arizona State Courts for their use. 
Our OEAC director, Debbie Talang Da Silva, has trained judges and court staff from Guam, Saipan, and Palau on how to develop a court interpreter certification program. And Debbie's also provided language access training for the State Department of Labor and Industri Industrial Relations. And I want to emphasize that the legislature has played an instrumental role in these efforts by supporting our requests for language access funding. In 2012, we received $234,000 to expand court interpreter services to all civil and administrative proceedings, and we're grateful for the legislature's support. And I want to especially single out uh, Senator Susie Chun Oakland, who was here this morning, who has been a great supporter of those efforts throughout the years. A cornerstone of our efforts has been providing language access training to judiciary, staff, and judges, because language access policies and services are only effective if the staff and judges are aware of and use them. In 2014, OEAC staff, including Debbie and Melody, implemented mandatory training on language access services and conducted more than 70 two-hour trainings statewide. Debbie and Melody trained judiciary staff on how to identify LEP individuals as well as how to provide appropriate language services. Debbie also trained judges on language access laws and services to assist LEP individuals in the courtroom. OEAC was able to accomplish all of this with only st five staff members, which is really the, an amazing job that they did in reaching so many people. As Melody characterized this effort, it can be accomplished so long as you have a commitment from the top down and training from the bottom up. Providing meaningful and appropriate language access is a legal mandate, but it's more than that. It's the right thing to do. Even though we've made significant strides at the judiciary, we continue to work every day to strengthen our services, increase the number of qualified interpreters, and ensure that our staff and judges receive appropriate training. Language access is not a luxury. It is a matter of fundamental justice that goes to the heart of who we are as a state and a nation. Through your efforts, we will ensure that everyone, including LEP individuals, will be able to fully participate in our democratic system of government. Thank you so much for having me here today, and aloha. Thank you. Thank you very much.